Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar uh, on how to advocate for local transit in your community. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are excited about this important conversation and very pleased to bring you a panel of experts from around the country. Uh, they'll speak to you today on data, storytelling, and vital information needed to bring more transit options into your community. Um, during today's conversation, we'll hear from Laura Weens, Executive Director of Pittsburghers for Public Transit, Fred Neal Jr., planning, a senior planning, uh, sorry, senior planner with Villa Vasso and Associates, and Christoph Spieler, Vice President and Director of Planning at Hewitt Zollers. David Bragdon, Executive Director of Transit Center, will moderate, and everyone will have a more detailed introduction shortly. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded for those who would like to listen later or share with others. It's free to distribute and will be a valuable educational resource for local officials, students, planners and designers, and anyone interested in tra transit advocacy. Um, expect to see an email with the video link um, along with the PowerPoint slides and any other relevant resources uh, that we'd like to share with you in the next few days. Um, the PowerPoints are also available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, our webinar today is hosted by Island Press. Uh, Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher founded in 1984. Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to its complex problems. Island Press elevates voices of change, shines a spotlight on crucial issues, and focuses attention on sustainable solutions like we're doing today with this free webinar presentation. Um, Island Press's Urban Resilience Project is a collaborator of the webinar as well. The Urban Resilience Project, or ERP, began in 2013 with support from the Kresge Foundation and the JPB Foundation. ERP works to imagine and inspire the sustainable, equitable, resilient cities of the future, bringing together thought leaders with a broad range of experience to generate and cross-pollinate ideas. All right, now I'd like to get into the conversation uh, by introducing our moderator today, David Bragdon. David has been at the helm of Transit Center since 2013, leading its reinvention as a civic philanthropy. David is a reformer by nature who has led change and organizational improvements in both the public and private sectors. He spent the early part of his career as a maritime and aviation freight dog and was then elected to two terms as president of the Metro Council, the regional government for the Portland, Oregon area. He drove a taxi cab for a year, jump seated a 747 freighter into the then USSR, rode a Dutch container ship up the Strait of Malacca and twice, once for two minutes in Minnesota and once for five minutes in Iowa, has been allowed to run the engineer's the engineer's throttle of a freight train. So he knows how to move big things. And I will send it over to you, David. Well, thanks thanks very much, Jen. And thanks to Island Press and the Urban Resilience Project for sponsoring today. Let's start with why we do this work in the first place in transportation and why advocacy is the indispensable element to making change happen in the world of transportation. Well, we work on these issues because we're confronting two, the two biggest issues, I would argue, the two biggest challenges facing our society and particularly our cities these days. One is the growing inequality and unfairness economically and in terms of social inclusion in our country and the growing disparities between haves and have nots. And secondly, the challenges to our environment, particularly climate change. And neither of those issues can be addressed without good, useful public transportation that's of useful value to more and more people. But we're not going to get better and more comprehensive public transit unless we really reform the way transportation policy is made and the way that agencies conduct themselves. And that's really where advocacy is the key. Our cycle of change, our our here at Transit Center that we've developed in terms of where we have seen change happen. And this is based on research that we've done. This is not just our opinion, but in city after city, change comes not from within the agencies and often not from the city leadership itself. It almost invariably starts with a civic vanguard of people who care about their community. They may care about the air being clean. They may care about 
people having access to jobs. They may care, care about economic development. They may care about protecting their neighborhoods, but they're they're doing it out of a passion for for making things better as 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 a civic vanguard organizations that are dedicated in community-based organizations and they influence the city leadership our elected leaders need to be responsive to to what they hear from citizens and it's when city leadership embraces what they're hearing from the community uh, from from that advocacy that they then drive the change into the into the agencies and make things change for the long haul in terms of how agencies are conducting themselves so that's been the, the the paradigm that really drives our approach at Transit Center, that starting with advocacy is 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 the key. Our own work here at Transit Center involves research, applied research, uh, publications, workshops that we organize on emerging topics, as well as grant making in, in a conventional financial sense. And so we're we're really lucky to be acquainted with our three panelists today in a variety of ways. Let me introduce them all, all three at, at once and then then we'll go in sequence as they present. Christoph Spieler is Vice President and Director of Planning at Huitzalers in Houston, Texas, though it's an international firm. He's a senior lecturer at Rice University, which is also his alma mater. He was a member of the board of directors of the Houston Transit System Metro for eight years, and in that role as chair of the Strategic Planning Committee, initiated the transit system reimagining process, which was a blank sheet redesign of the entire bus system. And as a result of that, as, as well as the addition of service, uh, uh, Houston is one of the cities that is growing ridership today. He's active in the American Public Transit Association's Sustainability and Urban Design Working Group, where he's drafted national standards on transit and urban design, contributed to NACTO's Transit Street Design Guide, and he is a trustee here at, at uh, with Transit Center. So he is, he is one of my bosses. Laura Weens is the Executive Director of Pittsburghers for Public Transit. And again, on behalf of, of, of Transit Center, uh, we're huge fans of both Laura and the organization. We've been very happy to be supporting their great work. Over the past two years, Laura has led successful campaigns to prevent criminalization of fare evasion and big service reductions that were, had been proposed that would have been imposed disproportionately on marginalized communities that she and her, her colleagues went out and organized, and they got that proposal turned around. And their rider leaders are now advancing other campaigns for equity in the fare system, affordable housing and transit policy, and advocating for transit as a climate solution. Her roots are in labor organizing with Unite Here, labor organization, and she draws from that organizing experience to mobilize transit riders in a fight for equity, access, and transparency and accountability within public agencies like transit agencies or the city DOT. She's a real believer in the collective power of people to transform their communities, and the work of Pittsburghers for Public Transit proves that, that belief every day. And then Fred Neal is a senior planner with Villa Vosa and Associates in New Orleans. He's a commissioner of the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority Board. So that's an example of this, uh, this graphic here, actually, of somebody going from Civic Vanguard where he was an advocate with Ride New Orleans. He was a finding, founding member of Ride New Orleans and then moved into city leadership by virtue of his appointment by Mayor Crantel. So he, he personally migrates among these, these circles here that we see. As a, as a board member and as a founding board member of Ride New Orleans, he plays a critical role in building the rider's voice and driving the conversation around transit so that it really serves riders, the people who need and use it the most. And that organization has won like Pittsburghers for Public Transit has has really won some big campaigns to improve on the transit system in New Orleans. He lives in the historic central city neighborhood of New Orleans, walks the talk, uses the bus and streetcar and bike share for most of his daily trips. And like Christoph, he has also uh, more recently joined the board of Transit Center's trustees. So he is also my boss. Uh, one of my bosses. So it's great to be able to be here with them. And we'll turn it over first to Christoph, and then we'll go to Laura, and then wind up with Fred. And there will be lots of time for your questions at the end. Thank you.
so I'm Christoph Spieler. I think David did a good job of introducing me, and I wrote a book called Trains, Buses, People, an Opinionated Atlas of U.S. Transit, which came out in October from Island Press, um, which very much reflects my history with transit. I'm in Houston, but I'm in a part of Houston that most people probably aren't imagining. What you can see here is both where I live, where I work, and the commute I make every day on light rail, um, which makes my life better, more comfortable, easier on a daily basis. I believe in transit because transit makes people's lives better, and I believe in transit because transit builds better cities. Um, like Fred, I came at this from an advocate standpoint. Actually, before I did planning for a living, before I was on the Metro board, I was a community activist fighting for better transit. And in that position, I saw the effect that communities can have in shaping the transit agenda for the better. And I was actually the first person appointed to the Houston Metro board as a result of writing a blog. Um, so I came to that board with an activist perspective. And while being on the board, I saw how good activism helped move transit forward in Houston. That we as appointees on that board really could not be effective unless there was a larger discussion outside of that boardroom. So the book is really about what makes good transit and it's got three sections to it. Um, the heart of it is every metropolitan area in the United States that has rail or BRT mapped compared, looking at the frequent transit network compared to population, described, talking about the history of the transit in that city, talking about the decisions that city made, and really comparing which systems are performing well and which aren't, which metro areas are doing well and which aren't. And then two other sections, one of them is a background on how transit works in the United States, understanding the issues of things like financing and governance that shape our transit systems. And the second is, a section that talks about what makes transit successful. And in the book, I really break that down to these points. And these are obvious to those of us who ride transit on a daily basis, but I think it's really important to articulate them. It's really important to have a language to talk about them because these are the things we need to advocate for. And these are the things that all too often US transit actually falls short on. Uh, so for example, density, we know that transit does best, it will get the most ridership, it will help the most people if we build it to places that have density. You want transit systems that match the distribution of people. And often advocates have to fight for this. We have to fight for getting transit where it will help people, for where it will help people who need it the most, as opposed to a line that looks impressive on a map or a line that hits the right jurisdictions, but which may not be useful to many people. And likewise, activity. We need to fight for getting transit to go to major employment centers where people need to get for work. Um, we need to push to make sure it's in the right places so that people can actually get to where they're trying to go from those stations. And we also need to push that transit serves the needs of all people, that if you are going to depend on transit um, every day, then it's not just about getting to your job, it's about getting to church, it's about getting to the grocery store on a Sunday morning. And also remember that there's somebody who works in that grocery store on a Sunday morning, which means there's a lot of people who need to get to work outside the usual nine to five. And I find a lot of transit systems have neglected both of those things, have focused on employment and not on all the other things we do. And have ignored the service industry, the people who work nine to five, who are a growing part of the American population. We also need to think about walkability. Uh, transit isn't useful until you get there and the best first and last mile technology is a sidewalk. And transit advocates have to be pedestrian advocates, have to think about how can we make that safe and comfortable that you can actually get to that transit station. Connectivity. And all of the successful rail and BRT lines are successful because they connect to a larger transit network, like this example from Houston right here. And that's something that advocates often have to speak up for as well. We have a tendency to build rail lines without thinking about how they connect to a larger system. We also have to fight for things like making sure those transfer points are safe and comfortable. One of the fights Fred has fought in New Orleans is the main downtown transfer hub, which had no benches or shelters. 
at one of the most important stops in the transit system. Laura has pushed for better BRT connectivity so those systems serve more people. And in a lot of cities, fare systems are still working against connectivity. Frequency, how often that transit comes. And uh, one of our biggest problems is infrequent transit. How do we get agencies to improve midday frequency, improve weekend frequency, improve evening frequency? Travel time, making transit fast, which requires things like bus lanes. How do we get transit out of traffic? And there are constituents for every single piece of a city street who will fight for on-street parking, will fight for general traffic lanes. Transit will not get better. Transit will not get more, more reliable. Transit will not get faster unless there are voices out there saying, we need to give transit its own space in the city so that it can be efficient. Um, we also need to push to make sure that transit systems are easy to understand. Legibility is essential. I love this picture right here because this is Santa Monica. You can see the beach in the distance. You can see the train. You can see where it will take you. And you can see the connection between them. People will not ride transit unless it's easy to understand. And again, that's something that transit agencies need to take that perspective of the customer, that perspective of the rider, and that often they will only do that if those riders are actually speaking up. And we need to think about inclusivity. We need to think about making sure a transit network serves everyone. And that's in questions like what kind of service do we have in what kind of neighborhoods? But it's also in questions like, is that transit friendly to somebody with kids, to somebody who's bringing a stroller on board? Can somebody in a wheelchair make it to the bus stop? Um, and things like fare enforcement. Um, there are communities which may be comfortable with having armed police officers enforce fares, but there's other communities where they have a long history that tells them that that can be a dangerous thing. So all of these are things we know how to do, but all of these are also things that we often don't do. If you look at transit across the United States, you see some lines perform far better than others. Um, and that's not because we don't know how to do transit planning. Fundamentally, transit planning is really simple. You look at a city and you can see where the activity centers are. You're seeing a literal three-dimensional bar graph of density right here. If you want to plan a good transit network, you figure out where the population is, you figure out where the major centers are that we have to connect together, and you draw lines to connect those centers together. But remarkably, over and over again, we do not do a good job of this. Our transit resources are limited to start with, and it's remarkable how many of those resources we're investing in places where they really don't do a lot of good for a lot of people. This is literally light rail running through a cornfield on the east side of the New Jersey metro area, and this is not an outlier. If you look at rail transit across the United States, it's notable how often those rail transit lines seem to actively avoid density. Here's a map of density with multiple rail networks laid over them. And notice over and over again that as soon as that line gets close to somewhere where lots of people are, it turns in the opposite direction. We really need to work to make sure we put transit where it helps. And why aren't we doing this right? Part of it, I think, is we get way too hung up on modes. We talk about rail versus bus all the time rather than talking about what makes transit effective. And you can see cities that have gone down the wrong path with, because of this that got fixated on ideas like we want a streetcar rather than thinking about what places need to be connected and what quality of service we need. We tend to hurry through system planning. The most important decision is what parts of town are going to get service. And that decision is often made quickly, behind closed doors, with minimal public input, and really with minimal thought or analysis. We put a huge amount of work into the details of each line, but that most important decision often doesn't get nearly the thought and input it needs to have. And we don't think about networks. We think about transit as one line at a time, one bus route at a time, one rail project at a time, when in reality that will function as a connected network. And if we don't talk about it and think about it as a network, we're not going to create a good network. And we plan single purpose transit. We plan transit for very specific groups of people. This is commuter rail in New Jersey, and that word commuter is a huge part of the problem here. The people who are making the decisions about this train see it as a train that's there for people who live in New Jersey, work 
in Manhattan and work nine to five and all of the decisions, schedules, fares, integration with other trains that are made around that, this train could be a lot more useful to a lot of other people if we didn't come with those preconceived notions of what it is. We don't use data. All too often transit agencies use GIS to map a decision after they make it rather than to make that decision. We think at too large a scale. We focus on lines that have a big regional footprint, not on lines that will carry a lot of people. Um, we think about path and not destinations. We think here's a congested freeway, let's put a rail line down the middle of it, rather than thinking about where are the people on that train actually going to and from. Transit is not a vacuum cleaner that just sucks up the cars next to it. Transit is about the destinations people are trying to get to. And finally, we avoid opposition. We have a tendency, transit agencies, elected leadership have a tendency to back down from fights. And this is a real problem because transit needs to go to places where lots of people are. If you have a transit project that nobody is against, odds are that's actually a bad project. So we need to think about people, not just about trains and buses. And we can do a lot better. We can advocate for better transit. We can do that using data. This book has maps of all of these metro areas with their frequent network footprints compared. We can use that to talk about which cities are doing well. We can use that to pinpoint where things could be better. We can do that by telling stories, by actually not putting the data in a way that people understand in terms of what this means for riders' everyday lives. We are advocating to people who do not ride transit and we have to explain to them how transit works. We can do that by setting the agenda, by putting things in the discussion. This is the fare system in Philadelphia, for example, and fares often aren't part of the transit discussion. Advocates can add that to the discussion, point out what's broken, point out what we can fix. And we can do that by working together, by building networks of advocates across the country. Um, we were actually on a train together this past year, riding the Sunset Limited across the southwestern United States, a group of transit advocates talking together, sharing stories, sharing best practices, and learning how we can all make transit in each of our cities better. If we can build these national networks of advocates, we can support them by good information. We can make for much better transit that will make people's lives better every day. And with that, I'll pass it on to Laura. Sorry, oh, there you go. Okay, and okay. So thank you folks. I'm really glad to be part of this. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to uh, be on a panel with, with uh, David and Christoph and Fred, all of which, all of whom I admire, admire very much. So um, I'm Laura Weens. I'm the director of Pittsburghers for Public Transit. Um, we are a coalition of bus riders, uh, transit operators, and residents advocating for equitable, affordable, and sustainable public transit. And we believe that transit is a human right, that the right to mobility or the right to move about a city is as fundamental as the right to housing and healthcare and food access because it is fundamentally inseparable from those other needs as well. Um, and when we were founded in 2009, we put together the Transit Bill of Rights. And I'll just point out that uh, notably, we believe that these jobs should be union jobs and that there should also be an equitable distribution of transit costs with corporations paying their fair share. So I am aware that for many of you on the transit agency side, and I know there's some of you on this call um, that uh, are, are from the transit agency side, that organizations like mine are a total pain in the ass. Uh, we get that we are the agency's biggest champions, but also the agency's biggest thorns because we're often challenging them to be more transparent and inclusive on a regular basis, which takes time and resources to do problem solving with riders and, and do community engagement the way we want them to. Um, the decision making can get messy along the way, so it's understandable that agencies don't want to do it. And I should say that a lot of my recommendations, um, I would say, are applicable to, to transit um, policy folks too, uh, grass tops advocates. Um, and I want to try to answer the question, why should transit agencies and policy leaders really care about doing good community engagement and rider advocacy? 
So one, you need riders to fight for funding. Almost all of our regions are starving transit agencies of resources, but we've seen real expansions of transit service in places where uh, funding or transit capital improvements have gotten on the ballot as referendum or voter initiatives like Los Angeles, Denver, and Seattle, or in sometimes it also becomes a key issue in political races like we saw in New York City. Um, in either case, you need riders to voice to politicians and the voting public about why the system matters so much uh, and why it's critical to invest in and vote for. And that really means playing the long game by building trust with riders and giving them real decision-making power between funding cycles so that they have ownership and a stake in their own transit system. The agency shouldn't really take the lead in these conversations for funding because it's seen as too self-interested and they need proxies like riders along with other advocacy organizations and business interest, interests to do the heavy lifting for them in that fight. That was true for Pittsburgh. Uh, in our region, we don't have substantial dedicated funding for transit at a local level. So most of our operating budget comes from the state, 60%. That has meant huge cuts in service over time. So a third of our routes were cut between 2000 and 2008. Another third of routes were threatened in 2008. And it's because Pennsylvania's rural legislators don't often recognize that transit is a necessary component of the economies of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and that funding for these rural communities really depends on a robust tax base in the cities, which doesn't happen without a functional public transit system. So we at PPT were formed, uh, this organization was formed in response to the funding crisis, and we joined a coalition of labor, uh, business interests, and policy folks to call for dedicated state funding for transit. And our organization, we did civil disobediences in Pittsburgh to raise awareness of how devastating the impacts of cuts would be and mobilized riders to take over the Capitol Rotunda in Harrisburg, as you can see on the lower right, um, and lobby legislators. And together the coalition won Act 89, which guaranteed 10 years of stable funding and allowed our ridership to stabilize. Um, and even last year, our region bucked national trends and saw a 2% increase in ridership. And we have some of the highest commuter ridership now in the nation. The other thing that I think is really important is that without riders at the table, agencies make bad decisions. Um, when planners either at the agency or policy folks that are steeped in transit knowledge are too focused on broad infrastructure or policy improvements without getting meaningful feedback from riders or having a real willingness to actually change proposals in response to that feedback, um, you can really bake in some very inequitable outcomes. As transit wonks, it can seem like no-brainers to support concepts like faster service through bus-only lanes and all-door boarding, uh, you know, better transit stops or better technology for fare collection like smart transit cards and mobile fare apps. So it should be easy to make good policy. Well, the devil is really in the details and that's why you really need riders to help think, think through those outcomes. So for instance, um, and this is something that Christoph mentioned, uh, our transit agency proposed all door boarding uh, on our region's trolley system, which would have sped up the pace of boarding. For those that don't know, all door boarding would require riders to pay before getting on board the transit vehicle, then payment would be on an honor system. So you need uh, uh, riders to be randomly checked to prove payment. But our agency decided to have armed transit police do those random fair enforcement checks with escalating criminal penalties uh, of $200 fines and possible jail time for un uh, being unable to prove payment of $2.50. And the agency was unwilling to hear concerns that were being raised by Im our immigrant community, the youth advocates, police accountability groups, and really heed the call for civilian fare enforcers and reasonable civil penalties instead. And as a result, this transit improvement really got to be understood by the public and frankly also by the transit agency board members as a policy primarily intended to aggressively punish fare evaders and not really about having a more efficient system of boarding. So the agency backtracked on the whole thing and it was a real missed opportunity to make a system improvement and get useful feedback about how to do it right. Here we have a transit station improvement on one of our greatest assets, the East Busway on the top left and it's funded by a TRID, a Transit Revitalization Investment District, this kind of unique funding mechanism in Pennsylvania dollars. Um, however, we have no formal policy at the city level for transit oriented development that's uh, that around zoning or policies requiring density or affordability around our fixed guideways, um, and nor does our, our agency have one, although they have suggested guidelines. Um, and so below you see a demolished apartment building with 312 units of affordable housing that was located 
adjacent to it. And now built on top of the transit center are these super luxury micro unit apartments, many of which have sat vacant for years and first floor luxury retail that's also been vacant. And this community of East Liberty has some of the highest percentages of African-American families and low income folks being displaced. Transit improvements shouldn't displace the very riders that it has been serving. And so here's a photo of uh, the intersection in front of the East Liberty Transit Center with Miss Mabel and Miss Myrtle, former residents of those Penn Plaza apartments, sitting in a couch in the middle of the street to protest the displacements. And now the Transit Center and the TRID funding mechanism are seen as tools of gentrification and displacement, not as transit improvements for riders. And finally, we had a bus rapid transit route proposed between downtown and Oakland. These are huge university and hospital employment districts that would have allowed buses to move more quickly along that corridor with the dedicated bus lanes and signal priority, which just makes sense. That would have been absolutely a, a useful improvement for riders. Um, and downtown and Oakland are two of the three largest job centers in the entire state of Pennsylvania. But our agency decided to couple the BRT corridor with massive proposed service cuts to a high ridership, high transit dependency corridor with a lot of poverty and, and more and more African-American residents being displaced out there. Um, and those routes would also require new transfers to continue downtown. And we have a spoken hub system. So that's very meaningful if you're asking that people transfer then twice to get anywhere else in the system. Uh, also because it would require that riders pay more. And in fact, the only additional fare revenue that was proposed from this BRT um, was uh, going to be from riders from that region that previously had a one seat ride to downtown, but now would have to pay for the transfers that they're gonna be required to take. And there was no uh, uh, projected actual increase to the ridership to the system overall um, that would generate new new fare revenue. And to our agency's credit, they seriously reworked the service proposal in response to criticism and preserved one seat rides to downtown and the service frequency. Um, but the other challenge with this project was that it was a $200 million project because it was bundling this huge water and sewer infrastructure overhaul into the project to support more development in an already rapidly gentrifying corridor. So not surprisingly, through this process, BRT has come to be understood as very costly and a driver of gentrification and displacement, and one that really disenfranchises riders rather than being a transit improvement. So. I would just say equity has to be at the forefront of transit investment. They should not at the very least exacerbate existing disparities. So how do we do it right, right? Um, if you, I wanna start by saying, if you want to advocate for riders, you're probably already doing it wrong. You should always be advocating with riders and make us rider advocates and riders collaborators in your efforts. Um, no one is more expert about what's good for riders than riders, right? Riders and, and transit operators, both are experts. Give them the tools to translate their experiences into policy solutions. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is uh, one, of the, the, one of the main campaigns is about an extension of the East Busway on um, existing streets and on-street BRT into um, some underserved communities. Um, and so we are, we are going to be using a participatory planning tool that will allow residents in the community to identify the places where they live and work and play and need to go um, and be able to map uh, possible extensions of the route along those corridors and see how it matches up against the places that they need to go. Um, and they will have the option to be able to uh, select overlays of, of important community serving locations like healthcare centers and schools and senior housing and uh, grocery stores to, to decide what are the, the priority community serving locations that are currently being underserved. And the idea is, is to give them the tools to be able to articulate to the transit agency and to politicians um, what is it that they want to actually see and how it will benefit them. Uh, and, and there's certainly no one more expert than they are in describing uh, what that's gonna look like. The second is that we need to actually give meaningful choices to, to community members. And if you're not ceding real decision-making power to residents, you can actually exacerbate inequ existing inequities or miss opportunities. And you have to give them the tools to think through how changes will impact them because they will likely raise concerns you weren't aware of. But a lot of times in community meetings, it's apparent that real decisions have already been made and the options that folks are choosing from are really just window dressing. And I wanted to share this slide from um, 
a community meeting that our city uh, had to, to address public transportation needs in, in, in a corridor in the center of our city. And they weren't actually collaborating with our transit agency in figuring that out. But they showed different transportation alternatives, including improved Port Authority bus service, shuttle bus, autonomous microtransit, private bicycle, and rank them uh, on, on whether they inv addressed environmental threats, promoted sustainable mobility and development, delivered in the near term. And if you look at what were the the um, the the different things that that appeared to be positive versus the things that appeared to be negative, like having a private bicycle somehow was not good for sustainable mobility and development, and Port Authority bus service would somehow deliver not deliver in the near term as opposed to autonomous microtransit, which actually would require um, changes to state regulations, new uh, new roads, new infrastructure, and technology that hasn't yet been developed. Um, and so there was, and then there was a set of uh, scores that were allocated to each one. And of course, Port Authority bus service ranked very low and autonomous microtransit ranked very high. And when we asked the city how they had come up with this data, they said that it was really um, a qualitative assessment based on a gut feeling. And that's how they assigned the numbers in the matrix. Um, so I thought that was hilarious, but it really also gives uh, goes to this larger problem of of going to community meetings and having uh, an idea or an understanding of what you're you're going to do before you bring it to the community. And obviously, you know, the residents felt really disrespected because their input was not going to be taken seriously uh, when the city was coming with a framework such as this one. And last, of course, make meetings accessible and turn out the right people. Ensure that the times and locations of meetings are convenient to working folks in the affected community. Provide childcare and food. Don't use transit speak. Um, nobody uh, outside of a very small cluster of folks like ourselves use words like or use acronyms like BRT and TOD and TRID. Um, try to talk in a way that non transit folks can understand um, and feel empowered. But I think. One of the biggest mistakes we often see is that we don't turn out transit riders, uh, we turn out property owners. So if you're talking to a CDC um, and telling them to get the word out, you're probably talking to folks that have different interests than the transit agency and the riders. Um, buses are actually, riders are literally captive audiences on buses. Um, you can talk to them there or at bus stops or at libraries or at places of employment that they're going to or as consumers of the different businesses that are in the community. But if you're turning out property owners, their interests are likely very different than, than riders and will, will create more opposition than you, you probably want. So lastly, this is our, uh, our major set of campaign priorities for the upcoming year. Um, our rider leaders and, and out of different campaigns got together to talk about what they wanted to see to build equity and ridership in our, in our community. And they came up with um, a bunch of different solutions that integrate housing and transit policy um, that make our fare system fairer, that extend our East Busway and make commute times faster. Um, and what I think this is for us and hopefully for you is, is not a template for policy, but a template for process, right? Start with the riders. Um, if you wanna advocate for riders, then you gotta talk to them about what it is that they wanna see. Thanks very much. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Fred, if I can figure out. Fred is getting his audio uh, refixed, so one moment, folks. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulty. Yeah, this is David. Maybe I could just take a moment while we're waiting for Fred. As soon as he gets on, we can 
we can go go to him but uh, yeah. we already have some questions maybe i could ask one of laura yeah go ahead absolutely would that work for you um sure so so we received a, a question about the role of sort of data and proving the case like how how do you use data in your advocacy and i thought laura you might be able to address that with regard to the mon valley case or any, any anything else you've worked on Sure. I mean, most of the data that we accumulate, and we are not data analysts um, in our organization, uh, are through surveys. And we also use to good effect the census data um, about around uh, no car households, uh, how what percentage of folks commute to work, um, and also data that the Port Authority itself puts out in their uh, when they make their decisions around where where service should go. And one of the things that we fought for was a really transparent process at our agency um, to rank different service requests on equity, um, uh, efficiency, and effectiveness. Uh, and we were really pleased that equity was actually weighted at a third along with those other two metrics. And so that has been really helpful for our advocacy as well. But we think it's really important to value Writer's experiences um, as much as data, because I think uh, that that is a form of expertise as well. Uh, Christoph, you, do you want to chime in on that as well? You you talk more in terms of the planning process, where, where you said you know there that we don't use data enough. That was one of your your slides. Do you do you want to chime in and answer to this person's question about the use of data? Well, I mean, first of all, I I think that there's a power imbalance when a transit agency has data and advocates don't. And I think in a lot of cases, some of the best advocacy I've seen is both using data and explaining that data. And I think Fred has some very good examples in New Orleans. Um, I also think data is a really good way to figure out who we're not thinking about. Um, that if you think about the ways that transit agencies traditionally do public outreach, um, you basically get the people who show up to meetings. And that often means there's whole groups of people you're not hearing from. Um, and for example, in Houston, one of the things we discovered with the new bus network is really understanding where low income residents lived pointed us to some places that really weren't on anyone's radar screen. Um, so I think transit advocates, in addition to using data to tell stories, can use data to identify areas that are worth talking to, residents that are worth bringing in, conversations that are important to have, because that data will show you where the gaps are. That data will actually be a way of, of showing you who hasn't been heard. You know, and I, okay, I hello, observe this. Is, this oh, sounds like we have Fred. So I'll, okay, I, yeah, I, I will hold the questions, and I think we'll just go back to to Fred's presentation. Okay, yeah, I decided to call in, and again, apologies. It, the great impact is until now. Um, so I will try to um get through this real quickly, kind of get through the intro part. Um, New Orleans had some unique challenges. Um, we had devastating system losses during Katrina. We lost almost our entire bus fleet. Um, there was a lot of interest on kind of rebuilding and planning. And essentially, some of us started to notice our talk about why was a transit a bigger part of this discussion? Um, obviously, as a result of population loss, but also a result of just not providing the right transit, um, the areas that were affected most were neighborhoods that, areas that had the least transit access were the neighborhoods that were affected most by Katrina, and also the areas that um, people needed transit, those didn't have access to personal vehicles. So about 10 years ago, a group of um, geeky planners got together and had a happy hour in a kickoff party and started a group that at the time was called Transport for NOLA. And the idea was to um, essentially let's look at a little bit of data. Um, let's talk to some writers and let's see if we can um, start a conversation about why New Orleans needs better transit. Um, that eventually marked into what is now right New Orleans. And I think, you know, our vision is in the Orleans region in which taking transit um, enables full access to jobs, education, health care, and other needs, and, you know, and emphasizing equitable, equitable, thriving community. I don't want to say this didn't happen overnight. Um, there was a lot of trial and error. But one of the things you have to have with that organization that talks about advocacy is great staff. Um, I do want to thank our first executive director, Rachel, and our current staff, Alex, Matt, Courtney, and Maya, who are the ones that are on the ground to help implement this vision of the organization. So 
what we have come up with with RIDE is essentially we call it a three-pronged strategy to affect change and advocacy that leads to change. Um, it's driving the conversation around transit, um, building the rider voice, and winning tangible change. And I'm going to go in detail with these. So driving the conversation. And Christoph mentioned um, a comment about data and how um, agencies don't always do a great job at looking at data, utilizing data. Um, in our, with our um, group that started RIDE, actually, we'll be honest, community outreach was not one of our strengths, but um, we had a lot of analytical capacity and were able to look at data and understand data and try to use that as a tool to create a picture um, for the public, for everyone, for the agencies, for the public, and for riders about where our gaps were in the transit we were providing. Um, so we, and one of the things we did, we developed a year report called the State of Transit Report that talks about um, data and service, and it's now even more to think, to becoming a more visionary report that um, outlines goals and needs that we see um, to create better transit for the community. Um, but, you know, you can use data as a tool. We use data as a tool to spread the conversation to stakeholders um, to also get some press and to bring attention to transit issues and, you know, to position right as a voice's expertise in this area um, and that we're going to use quality data um, to make our case and we're going to make our, a clear and consistent case of the public for transit. Um, one of the things that we had to, that we did in, when, when we first started, we actually were um, very much supportive of streetcar expansions as an idea. Um, and I do want to say there was a conversation, Christoph and Laura mentioned about mode and how we can get caught up on mode. Um, one of the things we realized is, you know, what we really need to do is think about what the type of service we're trying to provide and who we're providing it for. And for various reasons, there was an emphasis from the agency and from our city leaders post Katrina and streetcar. And as you can see, what happened is that in 2000, 2016, we had essentially, because of two streetcar expansions, we're providing more streetcar service than we were before Katrina, but only providing 42% of the bus trips, which served um, a lot of our population. And, you know, again, outside of the mode conversation, streetcars are very expensive. So it's also, um, we started to dig in and really say, let's talk about capital priorities. When you have limited funding, um, what are the tools, the transit tools and transit projects we need to emphasize to um, provide better transit? Aligning with that point, um, the next slide, it's, this shows on the left side, 2005, and the green is route, bus routes that had, well, it's our full system, so bus and street corner, that had peak time frequencies of 15 minutes or less. Um, as you can see, you know, the red is 30 minutes to 60 minutes. The kind of dark brown is greater than 60 minutes. Today, essentially, we have streetcar routes that have 15-minute peak frequencies, and our bus service, that's more from where we had numerous bus routes that had 15-minute peak service before Katrina to, um, you know, to really, I think, only one bus route that qualifies us now. And I kind of skipped through it, but I do want to say this before I get to the next slide. Some, a lot of this is not necessarily due to bad decision making by transit policymakers, but it is due directly to some of the losses we, our system, or our city had during Katrina. So while we acknowledge that, we also think that as we move forward, we need to prioritize the right type of service to provide better, the right type of mode, and really the right type of transit service for our community's needs. So this next slide. Um, and as you see, it rotates back and forth. First, um, the second slide is the percentage of jobs, which is starkly accessible if you have a car within 30 minutes or less in general New Orleans transit area. Um, the other slide is jobs that if you transit or walking. And essentially, if you have access to a car, you can get to 89% of the region's jobs within 30 minutes or less. If you depend on transit, the walking is 12%. So this is a powerful graphic, but one that really we use to really very concisely show to the non-technicians, the folks who maybe aren't steeped in, you know, transit knowledge, but what the problem is that we're trying to address. Um, the 
we had to focus on building the rider voice. Um, a couple of years ago, we got together a couple of focus groups of riders, and they developed um, well that group turned into the Coalition for Quality Transit. And um, this rider-led effort developed 10 principles for quality transit, reliability, fast service. As you can see, they're all very basic and straightforward, but this is, we realize we could speak about the data and we can speak from a policy standpoint, but if we don't have riders who can join us to advocate for better transit, then, you know, number one, the agency is less inclined to listen, but we also aren't very effective in communicating that message. So, and there's a slide, this is some of our organizing efforts with different neighborhood groups. Um, but this coalition is not a key piece. We also have a tool that we can say, from advocacy side, we go to the agency, these are riders' priorities. If we want to talk about new transit service, our new projects, do these projects align with the riders' priorities? Um, and last, campaigns that win um, tangible and change. This is a picture of a better bus stop campaign. Um, the speaker is now the chair of our board, which at the time was a member of the board, of our agency board. Um, the other young man in the suit all the way to the left is a council member. So we realized that you have to have campaigns that, number one, and most importantly, help riders in their daily transit experience, but it also helps to have campaigns that can capture um, political support and support from stakeholders and allies. Um, additionally, another recent campaign is a bus to opportunity. Um, it was extending, um, advocating for extending a bus route um, to become truly a regional route, extending it a mile to a large health center, health complex, a lot of jobs. Um, by extending this bus, which um, did cost the agency a small amount of money, but it eliminated, number one, it provided 24-hour transportation where it wasn't 24-hour service to a large job center, this large hospital complex. Um, it also reduced the number of connections that riders had to make. Um, and then two of the last things that we um, have advocated for that the agency um, has come through with is um, adopting a master plan to take mobility plan and also starting a process. Um, it's called New Links. And technically, this is, you know, um, a project that you could refer to as a conference of operations analysis. But the idea is this is a regional project with some regional partners that's going to help us um, really revision how we provide transit service to New Orleans. Um, but the key is advocating for master plan, strategic mobility plan, and then making sure that the key components of that plan or implementation, which included the next step of getting to this next analysis, are included in the plan. Um, we got some pushback on the advocacy side, but we have been successful, and now we are in the middle of this planning project. So I want to kind of end, and again, apologies for the technical difficulties, and I know I have a little bit of time for, um, for questions. Um, so these are four pictures, and what I want to say is that in, um, I am in all four of these pictures. However, in two of the pictures, I am holding a sign. And one of the things that, you know, I have this very amazing transition from the advocate um, to a decision maker, um, but being an advocate isn't always writing great reports or, you know, being the star of the press conference or yelling and screaming at agency meetings. Sometimes it is simply being there when there's an issue to be addressed and doing whatever is needed, including speaking to the community, going out and helping with your advocacy. Um, sometimes it's just holding a sign. And these small kind of touches and these small engagements that you may think, oh, this is just a great activity. You never know what the long-term benefits of that will end up. Um, and the picture in the top right corner is um, at the time Councilwoman Kentrell. Um, we did a campaign where Christoph mentioned this horrible area that we still need to address, that where there are no shelters and no seating, we rented a U-Haul and a bunch of chairs and put chairs out one afternoon and gave people water and snacks um, and held a press conference, which everyone in the city council attended. Mayor Cantrell, over time, became a voice. Um, Councilman Cantrell, she got elected, and um, I got an email asking if I would be interested in joining the Regional Transit Authority Board as a commissioner. Um, and maybe it wasn't exactly because of that one event and that one engagement, but all these engagements matter. And I think as an advocate, sometimes we think we're limited to, you know, a certain skill set. Some of it is just being out there, and Christoph mentioned it, and Loris mentioned this, and whether it's acts of civil disobedience or just being there um, to support good transit. 
So last, um, just kind of personal lessons, because now I'm on, I'm, uh, I'm a commissioner of regional transit authority, so I'm one of the decision makers. I think advocates, you need to clearly advocate for trans, uh, transit. And it sounds repetitive, but sometimes we can get distracted by other very good causes like fair housing, um, I mean affordable housing, fair housing, um, even other aligned like like um, bicycle and pedestrian um, issues, and those are all important and are all integrated to transit. But there's a certain value about being very clear-minded that when we go to the agencies, we are there to advocate for better and more equitable transit. Um, being honest about concerns and expectations with your agency leaders. Um, building relationships and trust. This doesn't mean that you um, that you become co-opted or that you agree to to support a cause for various reasons, but it does mean that having a hopeful having a healthy relationship where there is can be conversations and in some cases the agency and the advocates are actually on the same side. They may be approaching it from different ways and having a relationship and trust can help to decipher that and make the path a little easier. Um, support good work in progress or defaulted to say no. Um, whenever there is a good transit project, as much as we um, organize around saying no, be as fervent and you know, support of saying yes when there's a good project that meets the goals of your uh, we're going to see it's better transit, and I skip one, but I have to say it. Um, challenge voices that claim to speak for transit and transit riders. What I've seen in my short experience is numerous voices, um, sometimes opposing projects, sometimes supporting projects, and that come and say, oh, transit will benefit transit riders. Or, oh, transit riders say this, or transit riders do that, or good transit is this, or good transit is that. Um, there's a lot of value in if you're really truly advocating for fair, equitable transit that you challenge outside actors who are using transit riders or using the transit as a prop for projects that really don't provide better transit. Um, so thank you so much for listening. This is our contact information. Um, I will actually go to the next slide, which is um, information for everyone on the panel. And I think we'll hand it over for question and answer. Right. Well, Thank, thanks very much, Fred. You know, your, your reference to you put out publications, but you also put out people in chairs in the streets leads to a good question that, that others could comment on. It seems to us that good advocacy includes a lot of sophistic, technical sophistication about what good transit is and what to advocate for, but it also involves organizing muscle to turn people out to hearings. And those are two very different types of activities, different skills. Laura, you want to talk about how you'd develop both of those things simultaneously at one time in an organization? Sure. I mean, so I came at this with an organizing background. So I think for me that that's, that's always been our priority is, is about um, connecting with riders and elevating rider voices and helping them navigate uh, the sort of sometimes bureaucratic or rarefied world of, of transit and transit policy. Um, I mean, honestly, I will say that there are just a lot of smart people that do transit policy work both at the agency and in other Grasstops organizations. So I can help um, bring that to the riders, uh, but I think our role is really in amplifying the rider's voice in either embracing those things or, or uh, giving them context and, and you know, or, or um, additional uh, support in, in various ways. Christos, you've, you're, obviously your work is very, very technical and wonky, but you're also affiliated with Link Houston, which is a community-based organizing uh, group. You want to talk about those two different strands of work? Yeah, and I, I would say I would add to what Laura said that I think often we have to act as translators, that there is this very technical language of transit, um, which the riders need to understand. But there's also ways in which we have to help the riders articulate their issues in ways which become actionable. Um, you know, what is it about the transit service in your community that really makes it difficult for you? And, and sometimes that's also a sort of, we need to teach agencies about transit, frankly, but we also need to talk to riders about how transit work. And I think, I think part of good organizing is treating the public as intelligent people 
who can make good decisions and who can understand information. Um, and I think that's a really key role that advocacy groups can play. Great. And here's a here's another question. It's sort of a tactical one. And I, I don't know if Fred is still on. I can't see him, but if yes, certainly sure. feel free to jump in. Great. It's a, it it's, it sounds like at, at there are times that as transit supporters, you're cooperating with agencies. You want the agency to succeed, and so you're a supporter in that sense. But there are other times when you you have to be really confrontational and be demanding with that very same agency and call them to account. You want to talk about the you know the circumstances under which one type of approach is called for and the circumstances under which a, another approach is called for vis-a-vis -vis advocates relationships with the agencies they're trying to influence yes um so you know i will say first off there is a basic level of understanding and respect that we have to demand agencies um that that agencies have to have for riders no matter where it's coming from. You know, some of them just do a token job at saying, oh, we have a riders meeting and they can show up. So I will say there is a standard where if the agency itself is not listening to riders at all, to, to me that is a starting point where we ha we can't, you can't let that be the baseline. Um, but if there is a dialogue, I would say then um, it's um, talking to riders. Well, so riders can also be empowered and you know, advocacy groups can do this, and if you're really engaging riders, you are empowering them to be involved in the decision-making process. And it doesn't mean that you have to have consensus over every transit improvement or proposal for transit that will happen. And I would say, first off, this are the riders empowered um, to speak? Are the riders empowered? Do they have a voice? Um, and in some cases, riders might not always be right, but at least if riders are empowered and have a voice, and that voice is considered in decision making, um, I think from the agency side, um, that is a good start. When agencies don't empower riders and they don't listen to riders and they plan for transit projects that don't actually provide good transit, um, that is a line where I think at that point, as advocates, we have to stand up and say, we have the rider's voice with us. Um, this is also not a good transit project. Um, we need you to stop this project or reconsider it. Um, the flip side, just real quick, whenever all those do align, the riders voice is there, riders have been involved in the process, um, there is a plan that's being followed, there's an improvement that will tangibly benefit riders, the same voices should be able to say, yes, we agree with this. I'll note one other thing, one other dynamic I've seen with transit agencies in a lot of cities is there will be lower and mid-level staff within a transit agency or even transit leadership that has really good ideas and wants to do good things. But then you have political leadership or the top ranks of the transit agency, which is actually preventing those ideas from getting out because they're afraid the support isn't there. And that's some of the most effective things transit advocates can do is build those relationships at all levels in the transit agency. And then when they become aware of things like that that need support, be out there, be advocating for it, and give the agency the political room to operate, give the agency sure. leadership the comfort that yes, this is something we can talk about. I don't have too much to add. So I, I agree with both of those things. I think that, um, you know, when good transit projects come up against uh, bad, don't take away my parking space owners, or, uh, then the the riders have a really powerful voice there. And to be able to confront um, those folks and, and really help push forward um, good projects. But but a lot of times it is, as what, what Christoph said, there are, there are great ideas within the agency, but political forces that are opposing them. So we can give we can give some space to be able to to elevate those good ideas that the staff have or other um, folks within the agency. Well, thanks. David, I'll add one quick. Can I just add one quick? One other point I just said. You mentioned outside political forces. One of the things we've learned is we don't always need other political leaders to agree with us, but we do need them to advocate okay, to say, look at this project fairly, look at it from the perspective of transit riders. You don't necessarily have to agree with this for whatever political reason, but we just don't want you to be obstructionist without looking at the facts and listening to the riders. We found that very helpful dialogue. Well, thanks for all these insights. We've come to the end of our time together. So thank you again to Christoph Spieler, Laura Weens, and Fred Neal. And thank you to Island Press for organizing and sponsoring today's webinar. My name is David Bragdon from Transit Center. And thank you very much for joining us.